Es ist schon ungefähr 30 Jahre her, da begab ich mich für eine Reportage auf eine Reise quer durch Russland. Es ist schon ungefähr 30 Jahre her, da begab ich mich für eine Reportage auf eine Reise quer durch Russland. Auf der Suche nach der russischen Seele, der Duja Ruskaya. Der Weg führte mich unter anderem in die russische Stadt Nizhny Novgorod, die zu Sowjetzeiten Gorki hieß und erst kürzlich mit ihren alten Namen angenommen hatte. Ich handelte mir, es war ein Jahreswechsel und bitter kalt, eine feste Lungenentzündung ein, die ich mit Hilfe von ganz viel Tee, Fürsorge der jeweiligen Dijurnaus und reichlich russischen Antibiotika hinter mich brachte. Und mitgebracht habe ich aus Nizhny zwei Dinge. Eine Reihe von wunderschönen, aber unglaublich deprimierenden Schwarz-Weiß-Fotos zum postsowjetischen Verfall in einer schönen alten russischen Stadt. Und ein Interview mit einem jüdischen Philosophieprofessor an der lokalen Uni zu eben diesem Thema, nämlich russische Seele, das in dem Satz gipfelte, wir haben euren Faschismus besiegt, um den Preis, dass wir unseren am Leben gelassen haben. Das ist eine Aussage, die ich in letzter Zeit vermehrt auch an anderen Stellen gehört habe. Und angesichts der jüngsten Ereignisse in der Ukraine möchte ich mich hier ein wenig mit dem Begriff russischer Faschismus auseinandersetzen, und vor allem auch mit seinen historischen Wurzeln. Wikipedia definiert Faschismus als eine politische Bewegung, die von extremem Nationalismus geprägt ist, gepaart mit Führerprinzip, Missachtung bzw. Ablehnung bestehender institutioneller Normen, Verachtung der Demokratie, einer sogenannten dazu passenden Spektakelpolitik oder der berühmten Ankündigungspolitik, sowie der Reduktion des Individuums zugunsten des Primats der Masse. Faschismus ist ja per se ein eher inhaltsleerer Begriff. Fascio ist italienisch und heißt Bündel oder Rute. Die Fasces waren die Rutenbündel, die im alten Rom den Lektoren, also der Regierung, vorangetragen wurden als Zeichen ihrer Macht. Faschisti sind somit Bündler, Feinde, Zusammengeschlossene. Und verblüfft, die ersten Faschisti waren in Italien um 1890 linke Arbeiterbünde in Sizilien. Und erst 1919 gründete Benito Mussolini seine Faszini di Combattimento, seine Kampfbünde. Und von dort nannte sich dann die ganze Bewegung Faschisten und hat es an die anderen rechten Bewegungen innerhalb Europas des 20. Jahrhunderts weitergegeben als Bezeichnung. Einigen uns für diesen Vortrag darauf, Faschismus zu definieren als Ultranationalismus, gepaart mit Führerprinzip, Ablehnung demokratischer Prinzipien sowie das Primat der Gruppe über das Individuum. Ich habe bei dieser Definition bewusst nicht auch noch antikommunistisch hinzugefügt, weil das nur auf die faschistischen Bewegungen des 20. Jahrhunderts zutreffe und selbst da sind die Grenzen verschwommen. Marx war sicher kein Faschist, Lenin höchstwahrscheinlich nicht, Stalin wahrscheinlich ganz, nicht nur wahrscheinlich, sondern ganz sicher einer. Aber da kommen wir später nochmal zu. Zurück. Jetzt machen wir erst einmal einen ganz kurzen historischen Exkurs, weil äh, das mit die Geschichte und so. Also erstens ist es wie überall kompliziert und zweitens haben wir das in der Schule ja nicht gelernt und daher hat kaum wer Ahnung davon. Wäre aber wichtig ein, oder praktisch, denn es erklärt sehr viel von dem, was da gerade in der Ukraine abgeht. Also gut, die Wikinger Tatsächlich, die Wikinger, die waren, also waren ebenso unternehmungslustig wie reisefreudig und dafür sind sie ja bekannt. Und sie sind nicht nur in den Westen gezogen, wo ja Erik der Rote bis nach Neufundland kam, sondern auch nach Osten, sozusagen auf die andere Seite hin. Dort fuhren sie auf Flüssen wie der Dniester und dem Dnieper mit ihren Drachenschiffen von Skandinavien nach Südosten bis an das Schwarze Meer und begründeten damit eine Reihe von Städten als Handelsniederlassungen respektive trieben mit den Städten, die sie schon vorfahren, Handel. Man nennt diese Wikinger auch Varäger, angeblich sind sie für die Opak vor blauen Augen, so wird das leuchtende Stubland der Ukrainerinnen verantwortlich oder so ähnlich, die, so hat die Fakten. Der Mythos erzählt von einem Stamm der Wikinger, der sich Rus nannte. Von denen gibt es aber keine geschichtlichen Bezeugungen, also nirgendwo Erwähnungen in einem Dokument oder auf eine Aufschrift, auf einer 
Marmortafel oder sonst eine Inschrift irgendwo. Die werden nur erwähnt in Mythen und in Geschichten. Also gibt es sie erstmal offiziell nicht. Das ändert aber nichts daran, dass ab dem 10. Jahrhundert die Varega oder wer auch immer als Kiewarus aufgetreten sind. Und zwar die Slawen. Als Großreich der Slawen, so in etwa dort, wo die heutige Ukraine ist. Wir wollen das jetzt im Detail nicht diskutieren. Aber um Kiew herum bildet sich der erste slawische Staat. Der Mythos des russischen Slawentums oder des Slawentums überhaupt, des der Orthodoxie, erzählt von den zehn weisen Männern, die in einem goldenen Boot den Dnieper herunterkommen und in der Stadt Kiew oder Kiew an Land gehen, um dort auf den sieben Hügeln der Stadt das neue, also das orthodoxe und rechtgläubige Rom zu gründen, es mit ihnen wieder zu errichten. Die Geschichte wieder weiß, dass der varegische Großfürst Wladimir I. aus dem Stamme des Sviatoslavic um 899 in Kiew zum bytantinisch-orthodoxen Christentum konvertierte, weshalb ihn die Russen den Heiligen nennen und in Kiew die Wiege ihrer Nation sehen. Das ist ein wichtiger Punkt. Die, die, Geschichten, oder die Geschichte von Kiew und Moskau ist eng miteinander verbunden seither und lässt sich nicht voneinander trennen. Und sehr viele Argumente, die auch von russischer Seite vorgebracht werden, sind historisch begründbar. Er kommt nur zum falschen Entschluss oder er ist im falschen Jahrhundert für seinen Entschluss. Aber da kommen wir nochmal hin. 1240 fiel Kiew, die goldene Pforte, als letzte große Stadt der der, im Zuge der mongolischen Invasion der Russ und wurde völlig niedergebrannt. Das ist das Ende der Kiewer Russ. Da geht die erste Orthodoxie unter. Ähm, Erst 300 Jahre später, Robert Ivan IV., Großfürst von Moskau, die tatarischen Granate Khazan und Astrakhan und legte damit den Grundstein zum modernen russischen Großreich. Die Geschichte dankte sie mit ihm sind den schrecklichen Dante, wobei die Übersetzung fehlerhaft ist, denn die Russen nennen ihn Grozny, das der Drohende, der Strenge, der zu Respektierende bedeutet. Wahrscheinlich ist das schrecklich ein früher Beherrschbild der katholischen europäischen Fürstenhöfe, gegenüber dem neuen Mitspieler, der noch dazu die falsche Religion hatte. However, jedenfalls versteht die russische Geschichtsschreibung Moskau seither als legitime People, who were just his enemies, because he had the wrong religion, no less. So, the Tsars since him called themselves the leaders of all the Russians and meant Kiev and Minsk as well, so Ukraine and Belarus. And Kiev, well, the stories say that the leader of the Orthodox Church flew, uh, well, he, he was on the run on foot for quite a long way. It's probably not true, but it's a nice myth. So Kiev itself lost all importance and later came up again in Poland. The Polish people were Catholic, the local people were Orthodox and the Russians as well. So that leads to, to problems always. So they then proposed a community with the Russian motherland and then in a few battles Klimitsky um, succeeded in fighting a few Polish, uh, Polish um, armies killed about one-fifth of the Ukrainian Jews and then in 1654 he celebrated the coming together of the Cossack uh, state with the Russian Tsar Empire. So Kiev used to be Russian then. And now we come to Marty, he is Finn, and 
a high a figure in the Finnish secret services. He's still alive. And his whole life he studied the Russians and the Russian side, or how the Russians see the world. And in a lecture on YouTube he explains how the Russians see the world fundamentally different from us. For him, the 300 years of Tartaric leadership between the fall of Kiev and the come up of the Moskowitz and uh, Ivan Grosny are a key period. Unfortunately, I don't know Finnish, but the subtitles translated as a completely lawless period. Completely lawless also means victory of the stronger one. And apparently this leads to Russian thinking. You can also think, um, see this historically. The Enlightening period, Locke, Hobbes, Hume, Descartes, Montesquieu, all those thinkers that we found our thinking on, they never happened in Russia. They are not part of the Russian history. Until deep into the 19th century, most of the Russian people were slaves or de facto slaves and a few rich people and noblemen. And if you are a slave, you're not going to write any books. Industrialization never really happened in Russia either. Well, it did, but only after the October Revolution, when Lenin said in the Soviet Congress in 1920, communism is Soviet power plus electrification. The Tsars themselves, they thought they were sent by God. So, absolutist leaders. And the Habsburgs in Europe saw it similarly about themselves. And in this direction you have to think, if I'm God sent, I can't do wrong. And as soon as the Tsar has his crown, uh, his, his crown jewels, he will never be in the wrong. Whenever something bad happens, it will never be his fault. And the Orthodox Church is a state church. And it's entirely connected to the state. So they believe in the state and they help the state. And you can see this again now in the Ukraine war. It's unbelievable, unthinkable that the Catholic Church today would... Well, so the Pope said differently. He preaches... He never preaches, yeah, we do what they... Uh, we support them. It's unthinkable that the Pope would support a war. But in Russia, that's the case. Authority is given by God and being against it is a sin. So as the Christendom split apart into two in 1054, into a West and an Eastern Church, the question was, can you approach God with human methods, mainly thinking, or is God a mysterium that you just have, have to submit to? So the Western world developed the Jesuits and Marx Weber, uh, but the Eastern Church till today is deep within mysticism. So rational thinking is usually a sin. And mysticism is deep within all layers of society. 
isoliert macht und nachher auch Vladimir Putin Enlightenment was lost already with Stalin. So Soviet power and also Vladimir Putin after it have never lost the imperial demands of the Tsars and they also consider themselves without fail and without error. So orthodox in its word meaning means the right ones, the proper ones. And they also have their orthodox beliefs and they consider it their uh, mission to protect the Russians. And the Russians are meant to protect their belief. And that's also taught in the churches. Then and now. In 1917, there was the big fight of the Winter Palace and the civil rev uh, civic revolution and then the Bolshevik putsch, uh, putsch and then a civil war. More than two million Russians ran away into neighboring countries in 1920. Most of them were intellectuals or noblemen. And one of them, Nikolai Trubiskoy, was a linguist before he went west. And he also wrote philosophical lectures and theses. And in 1920 he said, there's just one true controversy. The Roman Germans, or one true conflict, the Roman Germans and the other peoples of the world, Europe and humanity. So in 1921, this book was brought out, Exodus towards East, in a Russian exil uh, um, publisher, exile publisher. And there were essays in it from our aforementioned philosoph uh, philosopher and a theologist, Georgi Florowski, a geograph uh, and others. They had and developed this geopolitically, uh, geopolitical idea of Eurasianism. Eurasianism. In the middle of a civil war in Russia, that went on till 1925 or longer, and within the mysticism, they had this idea as a conservative idea that says that a Russian-dominated continent that includes Europe and Russia that's in conflict with a Romano-Germanic world in the West. This continent, Eurasia, is about the territory of the Tsaristic Empire. So Russia is a Eurasian culture that's in conflict with the Western culture. The Western culture is not denied, but seen as unsuitable for Russia, because it's missing spiritual elements. Bolshevism is called ugly and denied entirely, and the problems or the, the tragedies of the Russian Civil War had made it obvious that the Bolshevism is not right, but also that religion has a saving element. So the Eurasians have the goal to connect, to bring all the Christian churches together under the leadership of the Russian Orthodox Church, and Jews are to be included, but kept separate. Azar has the 
duty in Christian love to reign in the state of wisdom where everyone is equal and also the Ukrainians and Ukraine as a country should find their place in this empire. The most important neighbor of Eurasia is China. Mysticism is a very important part of the Russian state of being. And being given by a God this authority is a lot of authority. And maybe I should also mention that already in the Greek philosophy there was this idea of a just tyranny and it justly killing a tyrant. The Romans knew of a right of resistance against an unjust state power. In the Enlightenment period, we can read this at Montesquieu's le in Montesquieu's letters and with theologists John Locke. Uh, yeah, they have similar ideas. John Locke said. The people should be judges. And the US Declaration of Independence mentions him specifically with this idea. So all this resistance is cannot be found in the Russian philosophy. It's not part of their being. There are philosophers of enlightenment who they know, especially Kant, they like him a lot, maybe because he denies this right to resistance, a right of resistance. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter though. A right of resistance or resi the idea of resisting is basically a sin for an orthodox Russian person. Back to Eurasia. So, the idea was to collect followers and resist the Bolshevik revolution in Russia in the underground. The Soviet Secret Service GPU infiltrated them. It was then split apart in 1929 into an anti-Soviet and a pro-Soviet part. The left part of them um, made Paris their center, but many of them were also moving back to the Soviet Union in 1930 and many of them were just shot. From the 50s the uh, Lev Gumilyov then furthered the ideology of the Eurasians and he was thinking of a very fertile symbiosis between the Mongolian nomads and the Ostslavic farmers. But he, he distanced himself more and more from the classic Eurasians. So why is this important? That's fringe, right? No, not anymore. Eurasians are not fringe anymore, they are at the center of power. And with this person, Alexander Dugin. Dugin is part of the inner circle of Vladimir Putin and he is his spiritual priest basically. Since the early 90s he is for a uh, for some sort of new Eurasianism. And the classic Eurasianism postulated a third continent, Eurasia, between Europe and Asia. 
but he sees it as Europe and Asia. So Dugin says there should be a Eurasian empire from Dublin to Vladivostok under the Russian leadership because the true geopolitically justified borders of Russia are at Cadiz and Dublin and Europe is meant to be part of the Soviet Union. Classical Eurasians and Neo-Eurasians like Dugin have, uh, they share the bipolar worldview that Eurasia has a main enemy. The difference is that classic Eurasians see the Roman or Germanic U uh, Europe as enemy, but Neo-Eurasians, they imagine that the Euro Eurasian land powers under the leadership of Russia fight the liberal Atlantic sea powers led by the United States of America. So Europe, according to Duggan, is occupied by the Americans and Russia has to free them, has to free Europe. For some reason, I have to think of Ragnarok when he talks of a final fight. But I have to say, a lot of cultures know a final fight, and that's usually meant uh, connected to the idea of rebirth. So Dugin, and this is important, does not come from a traditional Eurasian movement, but also new right-wing people from Western Europe. For example, Thierry or Alain de Benoit, but also uh, members of the Conservative Revolution like Karl Schmidt or Karl Haushofer. So I just want to mention it carefully. And there's a very important question. Why is Ukraine that's historically or yeah, historically until after the revolution had the same way as Russia? How did it, did it develop differently? And I want to give a small interpretation that might be wrong historically. I feel free to correct me. So the Ukrainian nationalism was not born in Kiev. It was born in Lemberg. Lemberg is the old Jewish name of the city. Uh, the Austrian Lemberg. And that was a hotbed of nationalism in a time when within the monarchy the nationalism was growing in general. The Czech nationalism and the Polish nationalism and the Ukrainian. Because the West Ukrainians, or the Austrian Galicia, that part of Galicia that is in, in Ukraine today, they had their own language. And they were recognized, one of 16 nations, because Ukrainians were considered Russians. There were white Russians, red Russians and black Russians. But the Udines, I think, were their own people. And Stalin and Lenin, so yeah, Stalin after the Second World War, when he reintegrated Lemberg into the Soviet Union and gave it to Ukraine. They, then the nationalism started establishing itself there. And then there was a Ukrainian movement also in the US. And at some point this national movement of the Ukraine managed to push the right buttons when the Soviet Union fell 
And I always said that the independence of Ukraine is bad for Russia. And when Putin says that the Soviet fall was the greatest mistake of history, then he also means the independence of Ukraine. I don't want to say it's right what he does. That can't be said. He's a fascist. Putin is a fascist. Now we can ask, is there a difference between nationalism and fascism? I say no. The British people will not like to hear that, but too bad. I, I like to explain how Putin can think and how he can be joined by a part of Rus the Russian people. And he has a lot of control over the media to push this narrative. It won't hold, probably. And I don't want to, like, old leftist 68 pe uh, people from 68, it's a German movement of hippies, who see Russia as a counterpoint to the American imperial imperialism. I just try to explain historically, as a journalist that I am, how it came that now Slavic brothers, who have been connected since over a thousand years, how they suddenly fight, have a fight of life and death. And this is horrible. And I think everyone can have their own conclusions, but I think that the Russia of Putin is a fascist state, and it can be called that and should. So that's not Putin is not the victim here. But this whole uh, this whole affair is also founded in history. And yeah, I'm looking forward very much to the Q and A. Thank you very, very much, Andre. Yeah, thank you very much. Two months ago you talk seemed weird and unthinkable, but since two months there is war in Europe. You lived in the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation. You are a political journalist. You are an old 68er. You are a data protector. Yeah. So what might lead a big nation to attack their neighbor? You explained it. Well, one explanation at least. And we have collected a few questions in the pad. One of the first questions reaching us is, is there a metaphysical argument today between the original Ukrainian orthodoxy and the state religion in the Russian Moscow exile? Um. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Yes and no. Orthodoxy as a church in Ukraine split into three parts. Also in Lemberg, there's Orthodox people. The Odins were Orthodox as well, but they are not in the party manage, under party management in Moscow. In the Orthodox Church you can choose who you want to serve beneath, because they have quite a level of autonomy. You can also become a metropolite yourself. So there's A, one second. Yeah, yeah, so this is life. 
<laughs> Sorry for that. So there is both an orthodoxy that's still um, loyal to Moscow, but also another one. But there's also a Luth Lutheran Orthodox Church that is connected to the Pope and is explicitly not part of the Russians. And they are building Baroccan churches. But they are quite orthodox and they have marrying priests and all that. We call them Greek Orthodox. Because some stupid officials just interpreted and imagined a name for them. But they are not competition. And the big fight with a lot of money in the game is between the newfound Ukrainian Orthodox Church that is their own church and within the Conference of Orthodox Churches there are not many metaphysical discussions, it's more about money. So Greek Catholic, <laughs> so my, my daughter who studied this said they are called, we are calling them in Austria different. So yeah, they, they have the proper belief in the Ukrainian view. Well, in the Orthodox worldview. The Orthodox people think they are the real guardians of Christendom. And we in the West changed it too much already. And especially we are not following the mysticism anymore. Thank you for that. Another question. Our comment. Thank you for this part of the Russian history. Can you say that this is how they see themselves? And really explain how the current events are ha happening? Yeah, that's what I would say. That's what I try to do. So, in over three years I lived in Russia and also in Ukraine and the Eastern Bloc. And I'm going there since 40 years ago. So first in the Soviet Union, then Russia. And yes, let me put it this way. The, the basic problem is Putin. Or the, so Ukraine is mostly Russian speaking. In the late 80s, when I went to Kiev, nobody spoke Ukrainian. Only in Lemberg they were speaking Lutene, so Ukrainian. But the Russian Ukrainians, they didn't see a difference between Ukrainian and Russian. And only since this war, Putin managed to make to turn the Russian-speaking Ukrainians into Ukrainians. And yeah, so the paradigm changed. Yeah, so they ha have a new definition. And yeah, the wild that the Russian, uh, the wild claim that the Russian uh, supersedes everything. And also violence against women and children. There is this saying that oh, it said that Russia uh, or Putin managed to do what he tried to prevent, the creation of a proper Ukrainian identity. It will probably become obvious only in a few years from now. But yeah, the Ukrainian situation, so it's been said that the Ukrainian exile is stronger in Canada than in the US and I know someone by accident and I thought the Ukrainian nationalism is a thing of exile 
and Putin changed it with one easy step. Today in Ukraine you will find no one. Doesn't matter if they speak Russian or have Russian roots who says they feel like a Russian. He managed that. No one does feel like a Russian anymore in Ukraine. Yes, so the question, what about people who really use these historical happenings or facts as a foundation for the arguments? Well, nothing. You can't really talk to them about that. It's something we do we see as ourselves as enlightened Westerners who say, yeah, with logic we can solve everything. I failed with that in Arabia already, trying to talk to them and saying, yeah, we want to talk to each other. And they say, no, we don't want to talk. We have our worldview. And if you don't share that, bam, problem solved. Next one. Yeah, following that, if the Tsars saw themselves as God-given, does Putin see themselves as following that? And can that really happen in the 21st century to have that image in the heads of the people? Yes, quite obvious. If Putin believes it, I don't know. None of us can look into his head. He considers himself as sent, uh, himself probably by uh, as sent by the by fate. This idea of power that's been established since Ivan Grozny, or Grozny. So it's been there for a long time, but I don't know honestly. Together with complete control of media and the narratives the media has been. I don't know. The killing and all the horrible things that happen. We know what happened in Aleppo. This beautiful city that doesn't really exist anymore. He could have stopped earlier. So I, I really love the Russians. But it really changes how I perceive them, because if they still run with this narrative, yeah, it's really deep in there, even in the 21st century. Final fight, Ragnarok, new Russian right, martial words, and the question stays, how can Russia, how can all of us get out of this. Well, if I knew that, I would get a Nobel Prize. Well, if someone listened to me, nobody would, but it doesn't matter. I don't know. At the end of the day, we'll, uh, Putin will have to be removed one way or another. Maybe he does it himself, or the Russians do it themselves. Yeah, I don't know. In Russia, there is no revolution of the people in history. It was always a group uh, taking power. Army might do it. And there is a lot happening right now. A lot of people are disappearing. It's quite obscure and opaque. And whenever I would say something, I would burn my burn my mouth. But he'll have to be removed. It's not like all of Russia is like this. There is a lot of Russians who say it's horrible, but they are a minority right now. Maybe a critical comment? And I want to repeat your reputation. You are a journalist, a political journalist and a consequent data protector. But we had a critical comment that the two of us as old white men are to be seen critical when we sit here and try to explain the world to a chaos community. But you lived there 
in Russia, in the Russia, uh, Soviet Union. And I would say, yeah, you do know it and have a journalistic background. Well, I have a profession and that's journalist. So I can go somewhere, take a look and see what I see using my eyes and repeat it. Nothing less, nothing more. I have no solutions. I'm not a consultant. I'm not GPNG. Maybe I overlook something. That's possible. Probably. From feministic or queer feministic uh, view, there's a lot I'll miss. But I don't think it, the situation has to be more terrible than it, it is. So I can only provide what I can provide. But to um, the opinion, everyone has to form for themselves and everyone has to inform themselves. I was there and that's it. And I can't leave my skin. Okay. Further. Do you have are any recommendations how to handle the current situation? How does Putin, without connection to the source by birth, by blood, how does he get legitimacy? Well, I can't really tell you. There was overthrows, so it wasn't always by blood. God gives the Tsar. And how God decides that? It's up to him. Yeah, and contradicting is very difficult in this line of argument. Contradiction is sin. Next point. How can we... How is the Soviet flag? Is it patchwork storytelling or are people there who want the Tsar back. Well, the anti-clerical and the socialist enlightenment that was usually already done with, with Stalin, but they want to bring times back or call on times and demonstrate the continuum of power. The Second World War was the last war the Russians really won and they paid a lot of blood. 20 million Russians, more than anyone else in the Second World War. And the glory of the Soviet Union is referenced. But there is a gag. The Second World War is not called Second World War in Russia. It's called Great Fa uh, War of the Fatherland. And Putin managed to bring the Russians together behind him. Oh, no. So the Russians were brought together because the Nazis attacked. And the word Nazi does not have to do anything with na uh, social nationalism. Or the, the yeah. So that the, it has nothing to do with our understanding of the word. It has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. They are anti-Semites themselves. So the Russians are anti-Semites themselves. And the Soviet Union was almost double the size as the today's Russia. So Ukraine and Belarus, maybe not twice as big, but they lost a lot with Belarus and Ukraine. So it's just 19th century imperialism. So in the 21st century, it's an anachronism, a dangerous anachronism. So if 80% according to questionnaires. So if 80% of all Russians agree with Putin, and even if it's not all of them, 
will a replacement of him not act exactly the same way? I don't know. My crystal ball is being cleaned right now. So I don't know. Probably, yeah, maybe. But I don't want to say anything about that. I don't know. I, I think the Ukrainians should beat the Russians because otherwise I don't know how it should end. And sometimes I'm really afraid. Okay, I'll add this question. Will this maybe create a new form of monarchy? So, talking about who follows Putin? Oh yeah, no. Power will be handed over via God again. So, following with a son, it's only it's only a thing in the West. But if you have a kid, it depends on what God wants, ultimately. So it doesn't really matter to them. Well, following this, geography, geographic. Yeah thinking about geography. So how about China, who also, whose leaders also claim to have the mandate of heavens? Well, that's completely different. They have a completely different mindset in China. By accident, I traveled when all this started happening, but no, China is not comparable to Russia in this direction. It's not even a comparison. So there's new questions coming in. So I read in a Swiss newspaper recently, when is the Russian man a man? So, what about toxic masculinity? The sublime homophobe that homosexuality has to be hidden. How would you say, is that part of this self-image? Is it man-driven? No. I don't want to mention it, but this this Russian soldier had to talk with a woman who said, yeah, if you want to rape me, use a condom. They carried it as well. So. Is there hope for coming Eurasian realm because of the German-Russian friendship? So the idea is that Germany would join Russia? Well, Madame Magenknecht would like that, maybe. Or find it funny, but I don't really get the question. The German politic towards Russia worked quite well and led to the German reunification and it, as long as it worked, it worked and the German Eastern politics was quite successful. Willy Brandt was perfect with the German re uh, reunification, but then one should have seen that it couldn't stay forever. Afterwards, so hindsight is twenty twenty, but I can't really comment on that. I have my hands full with Austria, I can't comment on Germany as well. Thank you very much. So, we exhausted all the questions in the pad. 
Maybe one last question. Your friends and family from the family uh, or your friends when you were in the Soviet Union, do you still have contact to them? Do you maybe have received impulses? Did you maybe receive impulses from them? How are you feeling about this? So the Russians, I've come to know them as a warm, spontaneous, completely irrational people, but I really like them. They are great. I felt welcome there, but sometimes they take turns, mental turns. When we would go left, they would go right. Or, so not left and right, but you know, they take a different direction. I noticed that back then, and I saw it as a sympathetic oddity and distinction. They are more emotional than us. And I, I liked it. Now that I see where it can lead, I like it less. Most of my friends, so, yeah, I lost most of them, that was 30 years ago. Those I still know think like I do and think it's horrible. Most of them also don't live in Russia anymore. My Ukrainian contacts are quite new. And yeah, in my heart, I'm horrified that two people, two peoples that I really like and where I didn't see a difference, that's similar like two German states. They're both German and they are more different than Ukrainians and Russians. So yeah, I have trouble working through this emotionally. I'm a, a bit troubled there. And still, early every morning, I check the internet. I'm worried early in the morning. And I still hope for Ukraine. And I, I'm for peace, obviously. But apparently there is no other way to stop Putin other than blood. And we want to stop the flow of blood. Yeah, thank you for your emotional words. And I also want to mention the hope that if we only think of the people, we can overcome these disagreements with enough time. Because we also overcame them when so a lot of people had disagreements or a bad image of the Germans because they used to be Nazis.